Chapter 41 I glance over my shoulder on the walk to the hotel. Call me Grant is ten steps behind, greeting someone. My legs tremble. I'm an ant on a sidewalk. His laser focus is the magnifying glass. Think of a plausible explanation, Donis. You're a smooth liar in your own right, calling out every guy who's ever lied to you, but never holding a mirror to yourself. Call Me Grant takes the lead as the conference center connects to the hotel. I follow when he detours down a smaller hallway. Another turn reveals a service elevator. I feel my insides twist as I realize we're bypassing the main elevators because Call Me Grant doesn't want us to be seen together. He presses the call button and the door slides open. As he motions for me to enter first, his smile is pleasant, normal, the one he uses with the other parents. I release my held breath and stride forward on steady legs. You got this. He likes talking. Let him tell you what he knows. If there's any hint he knows about the undercover investigation, you need to alert Ron and Jamie. Jamie. He never mentioned the fake relationship was his idea from the start. Can you trust me? The spot warms where his soft lips kissed my bare, injured shoulder in the hospital. A memory tattoo. Last night, being with him. Ding. The elevator opens on the top floor. When did it shut? Forget about Jamie. Focus. Be like Gagage, the problem-solving raven. An idea sparks as I walk toward the Ogema suite, where the Edwards family hosts their annual Shagala after party. I gain strength with each step because it's rooted in truth. You were in his home office to take pictures because it was a chance to be around Grandpa Lorenzo's furniture. Mom found refuge from Grand Mary's boutique in her father's office upstairs, where he had treasures in the shelves, books for her, Uncle David, and you. Maybe he will let you buy back the furniture for her. Because when someone you love dies, you find comfort in things connected to your memories of them. Entering the room, I blink my surprise. It isn't a suite just an ordinary hotel room. Why? I land face first on the bed, question still in my throat. Grant, he shoved me. I feel the weight of someone pressing down on me, but this time it's not Jamie. There are no firecrackers. This can't be happening. Why so curious about me, Donis Fontaine? His breath is hot on my neck. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Just ask real nice. My arms and legs flail as I reach around, trying to grab or scratch him. Unable to kick behind me, I scream in frustration, but the sound is muffled by the bedspread. You hockey girls are my weakness. Hockey girls. Did he mess with Robin? Is he the man she was talking about? I channel my white hot anger and fight harder. Try to dig in my elbows and knees so I can flip over, but I can't get any leverage beneath Grant's wrestler's pin. All that vigor and skill, grit and curves, he says. His hand finds a zipper at my lower back. I freeze. His hands keep going. It's not supposed to happen to me. The bedding smells clean, like a fresh sachet. Lavender. An instant later, I watch from high above what he does to her. Alone in the elevator, I catch my reflection in its mirrored walls. The girl in the mirror takes shallow breaths. She combs her tangled hair with shaky fingers. She blinks repeatedly. Blink, 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 ding. By the time the door slides open, her hair is no longer a tangled squirrel's nest. See, nothing happened. I return to the ballroom, music growing louder. Jamie sits at the table along with Stormy and his bored date. Shagala is in full swing. Holy, Stormy says. Didn't think you were one of them girls who takes forever in a bathroom. Ignoring Stormy, I shine my widest smile on my date. Let's dance. We're so unevenly paired. Jamie is all smooth moves. Baryshnikov and Denzel in a black suit and polished dress boots. Jamie Johnson, dancer and actor. Don't think about it, Donis. Nothing happened. Just dance. So I dance. There's an awkward pause when the song ends and the DJ cues the next one. 
The instant a drumbeat thunders from the speakers, the ballroom fills with cheers and lilies. I giggle at Jamie's wide-eyed reaction to the pandemonium. Every niche rushes to the dance floor for an honor song. Most Zaganash flee. A few look scared. I laugh even harder. Hands on hips, I stand in place and bounce on the balls of my feet to the drum beats. It's the closest I can get to dancing while still honoring my grief. Jamie stands off to the side, watching my favorite part of Shagala as if he has never seen anything so magnificent. Stormy dances next to me. I always forget he's a wolf dancer like his dad. The regalia includes a wolf's head and hide worn like a hooded cape. He hunches forward with arms bent at elbows as if holding a feather fan in one hand and his tomahawk in the other. Jerking his head from side to side, Stormy raises his tomahawk fist in the direction of the nearest round table. A Zaganash man at the table does a double take before mimicking the movement to his friends and adding a war whoop. The people at the table don't see that Stormy's dance honors Maingan. Wolf is part of Bear Clan. We are protectors and healers. I reach into my pocket for Levi's gift just before the four distinctive honor beats in the song. When they come, I raise my dad's choker to give thanks. I use my left hand, holding the gift as high as I can. The pain stabs my shoulder. When I lower my arm, the spasm reverberates through my entire body. Levi makes his way over to me. His hip-hop dance moves synchronize to the drum beats. When our eyes meet, I kiss the choker and raise it once more to Creator. My brother's smile radiates brighter than ever before. I'm the luckiest Kue to have such a great brother. After another fast song, the DJ gives us a breather. Acoustic guitar strumming slowly. Keith Urban singing about making memories. Jamie kisses my shoulder. I jerk back. Is it still tender? Beautiful tawny eyes full of concern. No, it's not that. I look away. Retrieving the choker from my pocket, I hold it out to Jamie. Would you help me put it on? He lifts my hair, letting it cascade over my shoulder. My hands press the straps of my top so he won't attempt another kiss there. His fingers brush the nape of my neck as he joins the leather ties, and I force myself not to flinch away. We sway wordlessly, my head on Jamie's shoulder. He won't see me blinking, call me Grant away. It works. I'm six. A happy little Kwezan, wearing the dress Grand Mary picked for me. My dad lifts me so my feet can be on top of his shoes and our steps will be the same. I look up in alarm, remembering that his legs hurt even more when it's rainy like tonight. He smiles, full of love. Izagi and Madonis. I tell Jamie I'm ready to go home. You sure? Levi said something about an after party? No, I snap before catching myself. Sorry, I'm just tired. Day caught up with me is all. We leave hand in hand. He squeezes three times. We pass Macy exiting the ladies' room, looking beautiful and flushed from dancing all night. Letting go of Jamie, I rush to Macy and push her back inside. She knocks my hands away. What the hell are you doing? She yelps. I growl into her ear. Don't ever be alone with Grant Edwards. Jamie and I continue walking in silence. Our words are to others. I tip and thank the coat check lady who hands over my mother's wool shawl. He does the same to the valet with his truck. It's only after we leave the Superior Shores Resort that Jamie speaks to me. What was that back there with Macy? Nothing. My shawl hides how tightly I'm hugging myself. Well, it looked like you were gonna fight her or kiss her, he says lightly. I shrug my one good shoulder. Just needed to tell her something that couldn't wait. Is everything okay, Donis? You seem so happy on the dance floor. He looks over. But it's like seeing Macy set you off. Jamie, I told you it's been a long day. My exhaustion is no act. He follows the river back through town. I focus on a freighter entering the Sioux locks. You hockey girls are my weakness. An aftershock ripples the length of my spine. Grant Edwards messed with Robin. Robin was addicted to painkillers but died from a meth overdose. Mr. Bailey's broken voice. We were trying to get her into rehab, not college. Grant Edwards' remark about my shoulder injury. 
Let me know if you need something for it. Jamie's route home cuts through campus. You're supposed to tell us stuff instead of waiting to be asked, Jamie scolded. Park behind the student union, I say before I can change my mind. I want to talk. Jamie gives me a look but drives through the empty lot to its edge overlooking the International Bridge. If he floored it, his truck could Baja the curb and go airborne. Can you trust me? Oh, how I wanted to, Oji Shingwe. I play out how it will go. Me. Grant Edwards might be involved with the meth cell. For sure, he had something to do with Robin's addiction to painkillers. How do you know? He asked about my injured shoulder today. He said he could help if I needed anything for it. That's not enough evidence. Well, how's this for evidence? Grant Edwards sexually assaulted me tonight in his hotel room. He held me down and when he was done, squeezed my bad shoulder. Said he could make the pain go away. When I didn't respond, he laughed and said I'd be back for more, just like Robin. Is that enough for the FBI to go after him? Jamie, what possessed you to go to a hotel room with Mike's dad? How could you make such a stupid mistake? You're supposed to be so intelligent. But all I see is a shit ton of book smarts and not one ounce of common sense. Why didn't you scream for help? And how in the hell could you just go limp like that? Odd how Jamie's scolding voice sounds exactly like mine. We walk toward the ledge. I halt, shaking and dizzy, while my bravery tumbles down the hill, away from me. I can't tell Jamie. Ron's FBI agent confessional replays. Donis, you do get that there is no actual Jamie Johnson, right? I turn to him. What's your real name? Startled, Jamie collects himself before answering. I really want to tell you, but I won't. He stares at the International Bridge for a long time, probably buying time counting the lights of the double arches on the U.S. side. Donis. If something goes wrong in this investigation, it's safer for you to know as little about me as possible. Once we find out who's running the drug ring, if they thought you had information of use to them, you'd be in danger. Telling you could get you hurt. I'm the one who's dumbfounded now. Staring at him as cold fury courses through my veins, when I speak, my voice is ice. Because confidential informants risk getting injured, or killed, right? Donis, what's going on? When you joined the investigation, you read all the materials. Got up to speed, hey? Yeah, he says cautiously, aware of a conversation landmine somewhere nearby. So you knew that a CI, my uncle, had died under suspicious circumstances. I take his grim expression as affirmation. And you researched me, learned about my science fair project, Knew I had one parent who was native and one who was white, something we could bond over. Jamie takes a step toward me, reaching out to embrace me. I hold up my hand to keep him at bay. Who had the idea for an undercover cop to get close to me? Whose idea was it to recruit the grieving local girl as the next CI? Surprise and guilt wash over Jamie. I wait for him to pinch the bridge of his nose, but he only stares at me. I make it a contest. He blinks first. What you need to understand, he begins stepping closer. My fist connects with his face. The crack of his nose and Stormy's goon advice from long ago register simultaneously. Aim beyond his head. The power's all in the follow through. What the hell? He shouts, hands rising to protect his nose after the fact. That's my girl. My dad's deep voice is as clear and strong as if he were beside me. Pride eclipses my anger momentarily. Levi Joseph Firekeeper Sr. was more than a hockey god. He was the fiercest goon on either side of the International Bridge. A car barrels through the parking lot. Headlights capture us in its high beams. That's for coming up with the idea in the first place, I yell. Rushing toward him, I raise my fist again. And for going through with it, knowing I could get hurt even after you met me. I swing and miss as he moves just beyond my reach. With nothing to break my momentum, I stumble and land face first on the ground. Instead of smelling grass, it's lavender that fills my nose. Terrified, I roll onto my back. My arms and legs swing at air. All the punches and kicks I couldn't deliver earlier. Ron bolts from the car, 
In an instant, he's crouched by my side. Are you okay? He helps me up. My lungs hurt from huge gulps of crisp October air. Ron looks over to Jamie. What the hell's going on? Jamie freezes, aghast. Ron, something's happened. Jamie begins in alarm. You're done, Ron interrupts. I'll get you removed from this case. You'll be lucky if anyone lets you write parking tickets. Jamie must not have heard his partner basically fire him because he's still eyeballing me. What happened to you, Donis? His voice cracks. I really want to tell you, but I won't. Ron walks me to his car, opens the passenger door. I glance over my shoulder. Jamie stands 10 feet away, arms at his sides, bloody nose dripping onto his white shirt, still waiting for my answer. I give it. What happened to me, Jamie? You did. 